and through the trust and support of our donors and supporters, the Arthritis Society is Canada's largest charitable source of investment into cutting edge arthritis research and a leader in proactive advocacy and innovative solutions for people living with arthritis. You can find out more about our work at www.arthritis.ca. So let's talk about what brings us here today. We know that living with chronic pain can affect a person's mental health, and it's not often talked about. Today is all about managing arthritis and mental health issues, including isolation and depression, and how cur the current research on treatment can help you discover practical ways to manage your arthritis pain. We will start by discussing some of the common mental health issues among people with arthritis, followed by practical management of arthritis-related mental health issues through the lens of a psychologist and a family doctor. This event has been carefully designed to deliver relevant, meaningful information to people living with arthritis and to provide a space for dialogue and uh, connection on arthritis issues. Before we get started, just a couple little things to mention, housekeeping things to mention. The first one is the washrooms are located just outside the doors to the right for those in the room. And I suspect that many of you in the room today have some sort of arthritis. So um, we will be sitting for some time. Don't feel the need to stay seated. If you need to get up and walk around the room, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so without further ado, let's move on to the main event. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Carson Chin. Dr. Chin is a rheumatologist in Burnaby who completed his training at UBC, um, including his medical degree, residency in internal medicine, and adult rheumatology fellowship. He works in a multidisciplinary specialty, specialist clinic and also does hospital rheumatology call at Burnaby Hospital and internal medicine at Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chin. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I was a little bit worried yesterday that the turnout wouldn't be really good with all that snow, so I'm happy that the snow actually melted. So uh, thank you for that introduction. My name is Carson Chin. I'm a rheumatologist in Burnaby, and this actually is a, a great location for me. My office is actually right across the street, so I actually parked my car at my office and just walked over here. So I'm a local rheumatologist here, and I'm going to be talking about um, mental health challenges in patients with rheumatic diseases. So one of the first things I'm going to talk about is just a little bit about rheumatology. I get this question a lot when I tell people I'm a rheumatologist. People don't really understand what rheumatology is. I don't even think my parents actually know what rheumatology is or what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. But in broad terms, you know, rheumatology is a subspecialty of internal medicine, and we're focused on the study of the connective tissue diseases of the body. And rheumatic diseases is a genetic, generic term that just refers to really joint pain and inflammation. And there are many different types of rheumatic diseases. When you look back at the history of rheumatology, you know, arthritis has existed since the beginning of time. When they look at Neanderthal skeletons over 50,000 years ago, they can see arthritis in the bones when they dig them up in the spine and the hands. So it's been around for a long, long time. Hippocrates in 400 BC was describing a what nowadays we know is gout. He called it the unwalkable disease, the disease of the rich. Gout is an inflammatory disease where it's a combination of increased purine in your diet. So when back in the day, when the rich could actually afford to eat meat, drink wine, they would have this unwalkable disease. So it's been around for a long, long time. Just a couple of facts about arthritis. So Arthritis is a devastating disease. Millions of people have arthritis. It's one of the leading causes of disability in Canada. Um, number one cause of disability in Canada. And we typically think of arthritis affecting only adults, but arthritis actually can affect young patients as well. So there are juvenile forms of arthritis. I'm not gonna be talking about that. I'm an adult rheumatologist, I don't see children. What are some examples of the common inflammatory arthritis that I see? So the number one inflammatory arthritis that I see would be rheumatoid arthritis. And many of you have probably heard of rheumatoid arthritis. It's uh, an autoimmune disease. So when we think of autoimmune diseases, your immune system is used to attack usually bacteria, viruses, but sometimes your immune system can get confused. 
So instead of attacking foreign invaders, they start attacking yourself. And oftentimes, they manifest with joint pain. Rheumatoid arthritis, typically we think of it as a just isolated to the joints only, but you can get multi-system disease as well, can affect the lungs. So that's a very well-described phenomenon with rheumatoid arthritis, can cause scarring of the lungs. Some of the other sort of autoimmune inflammatory arthritis are listed here, the common one, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, the list goes on and on. Gout is a type of inflammatory arthritis, or, but it is not an autoimmune type of arthritis, like I mentioned earlier. It's associated with having the diet sort of high in purine, and there's a genetic basis to it as well. Rheumatologists also see some unusual diseases. These are multi-system systemic diseases. Again, these are autoimmune diseases. Probably the most common one that people may have heard of is something called systemic lupus erythematosus, or lupus, or SLE. And again, it affects the body, can cause arthritis, can cause skin problems, can cause problems with the lungs, liver, everything, basically, the brain. And something that I do get uh, asked about is, you know, patients sometimes get confused. They think a rheumatologist sees any type of autoimmune disease. So I've even had referrals sometimes from other physicians asking me to see just for autoimmune disease in general. But we don't see just any type of autoimmune disease. We see autoimmune joint disease. We see autoimmune systemic diseases, so affecting all parts of your body. But there are organ-isolated autoimmune diseases like autoimmune thyroid disease, autoimmune liver disease, multiple sclerosis, which we think is an autoimmune condition in the brain. Those ones are seen by the respective specialists, like a neurologist, a gastroenterologist, or endocrinologist. So again, that's a little bit different. Organ-specific have their own. Multi-system rheumatologists will see, or isolated to the joints rheumatologists will see. Some of the other common examples of non-inflammatory conditions that we see. So these are the non-autoimmune types of arthritis that we see, osteoarthritis being the most common one. About one in 10 patients will, uh, one in 10 people will develop osteoarthritis in their lifetime. Some other common conditions that we see, chronic lower back pain, really difficult to treat. Again, one of the leading causes of disability in, in uh, Canada. Uh, another term you may have heard of before, something called fibromyalgia. This is a soft tissue pain syndrome. Again, it's not autoimmune, it's not arthritis per se. You do x-rays of their joints, there, there's no damage in the joints, but it's a problem with chronic pain and pain amplification. And, and they can sometimes present to the rheumatologist's office because you know they have been struggling in the community and they get referred to rule out an autoimmune disease or an arthritis. And it turns out it's not arthritis, but it's a pain problem where typical stimuli, you know, pushing on your chest or these areas don't hurt for the average patient. For people with fibromyalgia, they're exquisitely tender. You push them, they jump out of their seat. So they, this is a chronic pain condition, a little bit different again. Um, most of the rheumatic diseases that we see um, are chronic diseases. So I tell my patients, you know, once we start seeing them, you and I will become good friends. You know, they come back to me and see me periodically. If they're not doing well, sometimes they see me once a month, once every two months. If they're doing well, maybe once every six months or maybe once a year. You know, there's no cure for a lot of the diseases that we have, but there's really excellent treatments that we have now. You know, especially over the last 20 years, we've made a lot of advances in science and our treatments now. So it's, uh, it's been revolutionary. There are some, certainly some good days and some bad days for all patients with rheumatic diseases. You know, we can put them into remission, but they can also have relapses too. So it's a bit of an up and down, a little bit of a roller coaster for a lot of the patients. And that's really hard on the, these patients, you know, not knowing what to expect from one day to, to the other. Um, a lot of the rheumatic diseases that we, I treat can have really devastating results. And I'm going to show you some photos of some, some awful sort of outcomes in patients who were not treated or didn't have uh, proper access to rheumatologists and specialized care. So this is an example of someone with very, very advanced end-stage rheumatoid arthritis. You know, the hands are completely destroyed. There is not functional. It's very, very painful. They can't work. They can't take care of themselves. Uh, this is a bit covered there. Oh, there we go. This is an example of a type of psoriatic arthritis. It's called arthritis mutilans. And you can see the fingers are basically melting away. And we call that telescoping of the digits. And the inflammation is so bad that the bone is actually completely eroded and has disappeared. So it's a very, very severe form of arthritis. This is an example of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis over 25 years. He looks much older than his actual stated age. And this is a problem where you get chronic back pain. 
And it's seen in uh, young patients, it's an autoimmune inflammatory back pain different than the osteoarthritis type of back pain. You get stiffness of the spine, fusion of the spine, we call it bamboo spine, where you can no longer turn, rotate, turn your head, you can't bend forward, you're stuck in that position. His hips are also flexed like that too. So you can imagine how challenging it is to live day to day with that type of condition, with severe disease like that. You can't sleep, you can't drive, you can't shoulder check. It's a very, very awful disease uh, when you don't have proper treatment. This is a, an example of someone with horrible tophaceous gout. So again, gout is a problem with purine and you get cr uric acid crystallization in the joints which causes pain. This is a, what we call tophaceous gout. So tophi are these deposits of these crystals that can uh, uh, deposit outside of the joints. Very, very large, very painful, very destructive as well. This is a photo of someone with arthritis. On the left there is a normal knee. You'll see the femur and the tibia and the black space in between. So that's what a normal knee is supposed to look like. You have you know, that nice cartilage as the cushion between the joints. And you can see on the right is an osteoarthritic knee where you've actually lost the cartilage in between. Now it's, we call that bone on bone contact. Again, that's quite disabling, very painful as well. This is someone with uh, lupus. This is their classic rash. We call this the malar rash or the butterfly rash. Again, it's an autoimmune disease. It happens mostly in young females. Nine females get it to every one male uh, are afflicted with this condition. And even this can be very uh, disabling for, and distressing for young females to have this fixed rash on their face. So I showed you some photos of some awful outcomes in patients with rheumatic diseases. You know, that, we shouldn't really see that anymore. I've certainly seen that throughout my practice, but these are patients who have had diseases for many, many years and were not treated promptly. In this day and age, if someone were to be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis today, you know, we should not see those types of horrible outcomes. We have such good treatments available now, and it's really been revolutionary, sort of the, the treatments that we've had over the last 15, 20 years. This was an article from uh, Globe and Mail in 2012, basically illustrating you know, the advances that we have now with all the treatments available. So people with rheumatic diseases and arthritis have a lot of chronic pain. And I'm just going to go over some statistics here. So when you look at um, the Canadian studies here, depending on what you read, chronic pain is prevalent in up to 16 to 40 percent of patients. Um, this is a study from the National Population Health Study um, in Canada with over 17,000 patients. And they estimated about 17 of patients had chronic pain. And when they actually looked at the age, as we get older and older, those, of, of, uh, those patients who are 75 years or older, 35% of those patients reported some degree of chronic pain. So it's a big, big problem in, um, in, the, in the general population. This is another study from 2008 looking at the prevalence of chronic pain in Canada. They took a survey from 2,000 patients all across Canada, and 44% um, of these patients reported chronic pain at some, or pain at some point, and 19% actually met the criteria for chronic pain according to that study uh, for pain which basically lasting three months or more. This is from that same study. Often, many of these patients have suffered with chronic pain for many, many years. And you can see uh, up to 22% of those patients had chronic pain for 20 years or more. Looking at the causes of chronic pain, so that was that study, you know, that questionnaire from 2,000 patients, a long list of what patients reported as the cause of their chronic pain. So I went down the whole list and actually tried to look at what are some of the non-rheumatologic sort of causes of chronic pain. And I really only identified four out of that long list. So head, abdomen, stomach, and chest. Chronic back pain being the number one cause of chronic pain in Canada. But if you look down the list, every other joint is basically listed. Knee, leg, shoulder, neck, hip, joints, foot, hand, arm, elbow, ankle, entire body, bones, wrist. So again, looking at the degree of chronic pain in, in Canada, you know, rheumatic causes or M musculoskeletal causes are one of the number one causes of pain uh, uh, in the general population. What about chronic pain and mental health? Is there any link between the two? So when you look at the general population, you know, the estimated prevalence of anxiety, depression are you know, around four to five percent or so. If you look at patients who actually have rheumatic diseases, so this is another study from the UK in a London hospital 
they took about a, over 1,300 patients who had inflammatory arthritis or connective tissue disease, did questionnaires with them and tried to see, you know, how many of these patients actually screened positive for a, a mental health illness. And you can see 30% of those patients actually reported some degree of psychologic distress. 22% actually screened positive for a major depressive disorder. And similarly, 23% had a generalized anxiety disorder. And what really surprised me about that study was that 6% actually reported suicidal thoughts, which is awfully high. So you can see here, just looking at the numbers, you know, having you know, inflammatory arthritis increases your risk of having depression, anxiety, four to five fold compared to the general population. So it's a big, big problem. So that begs the question, you know, what came first? Is it the disease that causes depression or does depression cause disease? You know, I think for the most part, we think that the disease comes first. You get diagnosed with an, an arthritis, you have more pain, you have more disability, you can't work, you have social isolation, and that causes worsening depression. But we do know there's an interplay between depression and chronic pain as well. Patients who have more you know, depressive symptoms, more anxiety, actually report more pain as well. So there's that feedback loop as well that we do, we do know of. Fibromyalgia is probably one of the most common sort of co um, examples I can think of. You know, we definitely know that patients who get diagnosed with fibromyalgia, they typically have a pre-existing anxiety, depression, and we know that predisposes them to getting that more of that, that pain hypersensitivity and that pain amplification. Besides having pain and then that causing chronic pain, are there any possible biologic mechanisms that where pain can actually cause depression or anxiety? Maybe. You know, there have been a couple of studies where they, where they were looking at inflammation by itself and can inflammation alone cause depression and anxiety. So with inflammation, there are elevations of a lot of these inflammatory mediators. So some of them are called like tumor necrosis factor, some of them are interleukins, and these are actually the targets that we use to target uh, treatment. You know, we decrease inflammation by targeting these, these molecules. And this, there was an interesting study that they did where they took patients and they injected them with a bacterial uh, component, a bacterial antigen, so it's called LPS. It's part of the bacterial wall. And we know when we inject someone with that, uh, that protein, it causes inflammation. It doesn't cause pain, just causes inflammation. So they injected these patients with this protein and then they could demonstrate that, the inflammate, that these patients would have an inflammatory response and then they would scan their brains afterwards. And they were able to see that after they injected these patients with this inflammation marker, they could actually see uh, different parts of the brain light up where it could correspond to people having anxiety and depression. So it's actually an interesting study. So perhaps there is some, there's more than just you know, pain in, that's causing the depression in these patients. So this is a really challenge when patients have chronic pain and we try to manage these patients in, in our clinic. So this is another study looking at patients who were depressed or anxious and looked at their responses to treatment. And basically they were able to show that patients who were more depressed, more anxious, had uh, increased pain, increased fatigue. You know, this is a, uh, the, from that study. So the HAQ is the Health Associated Questionnaire. So some of you may have actually filled this form out before, you know, from the rheumatology offices for people with rheumatoid arthritis. We fill out this personal questionnaire asking, you know, about their function, you know, how hard is it to do this? How hard is it to go pick up, you know, your, your children? How hard is it to cook or clean? And it's a measure of disease activity. The DAS is another measure of disease activity, so it measures your swollen joints, your tender joints. It asks the patient on a scale of one to 10 how well they're doing, and then the physician score as well. And basically what I'm trying to show you is these are measures of disease activity, which we used to study patients in clinical trials. And when they looked at these patients and tried to split them up into different groups. So the top line is patients with severe depression. The, the middle line is the patients with moderate depression. And the bottom line is patients with no depression or anxiety. And you can see like across the, all time points and across both those measures, patients with more anxiety, more depression, had more pain, more fatigue, and did worse. So it was very, very clear differentiation between the, uh, those different patient population. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of real life uh, case examples. Um, so uh, I would say about once a month, I would have a patient come into my office and break down into tears. And you know, that's not uncommon for me. And 
probably around a similar amount of patients would come in and just tell me I'm depressed. You know, they use those words, they tell me I am depressed. Like they ask, they're asking for help. So I'm gonna go through some examples and show you, you know, what these patients are actually suffering with and why, why these patients are so depressed. So this is the first example I'm gonna show you. This is a patient, 38-year-old male, initial CA. He's a, uh, he's a gentleman who has a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. So that's that photo where I showed you where they, you get that stiffness and pain in your back. A recent diagnosis, not getting much better with anti-inflammatories, also has some chronic pain, seen from chronic pain doctors. I'm escalating his treatment with anti-inflammatories. I started him on one of these new medications called the biologics, which is a targeted sort of uh, therapies against the inflammation cascade. Not doing very, very well. He's using a cane to walk now. He's only 38, year, 38 years old. He tells me I'm depressed. These were his words, you know. So he can't work anymore. He's on disability. He used to be a fire uh, safety inspector, so he's off work. He says, I can't kick a ball with my daughter anymore. And he even tells me, I, I can no longer be intimate with my wife. And you can just imagine how much this is really impacting his life. So I'm gonna show you another example. This is a patient, JU, another young-ish patient, 37 years old, with the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome is a type of autoimmune disease, a little bit like lupus, but not quite. You can get arthritis, joint pain, dry eyes, dry mouth, and lots of fatigue. And her big problem was fatigue. You know, she just really, really had lots of trouble getting back to work. She has two young children at home. She's been trying to go back to work on a graduated basis, four hours at a time. That was too much for her. She couldn't do it two hours. That was still too much. And really struggling with her work. And her employer was not particularly sympathetic, you know, because fatigue is such a non-specific symptom, although we definitely know that patients with rheumatic disease have fatigue, you know, he didn't really believe her. You know, he's like, you just gotta push through it. So she's really struggling and she broke down in my office as well. And her biggest problem was really financial. You know, she really had to go back to work because she couldn't afford to not go back to work. But then when she went back to work, she also had to pay for childcare and working two, four hours, two, to, two hours a day, four hours a day, that wasn't really covering it for her either. So she doesn't really know what to do. Her husband's basically telling her, you need to go back to work and he's not really understanding that. So lots and lots of stress with her. And so these are two examples of you know, young working age patients who are no longer able to work and are sort of on disability now. And that's a really, really tough for patients. You know, work not only, when you can't work, it's financially stressful, but it's also part of your identity too. You know, a lot of people associate themselves with their work and their own self-worth. This was a, a, a study talking about employment and arthritis. This is actually done by the Arthritis Society. It was done in 2013. It was called the Fit for Work Study where they take 1,000 patients with arthritis and they just sent out a, sur a questionnaire survey. 70% of these patients were women, which sort of fits with the general demographics with autoimmune disease that we see. You know, women typically get more affected with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, those types of diseases. What did they find? So out of the, all the study participants, about 42% only were working over the past four weeks. So that's not a, a large number. If you took those who were of the working age, so 65 years or younger, only 50% of those patients were actually working. So a lot of these patients are not working for whatever reason, either disability or by choice. Is it all bad though? Not all of it, you know. So patients that were able to go to work in that study, in that question, they were able to capture that two thirds of those patients that were working said, you know, they didn't miss any work over the last week. About 80% of them said they didn't miss any work over the last month. And only 6% of those patients that said they were, that were actually working said that arthritis had a big effect on their, on their job. And across that entire sample, about 50% said they had never missed work because of their arthritis, so about half. I'm gonna bring up this concept of presenteeism. So a little bit different than absenteeism. So you, you know, absenteeism, you're not at work, presenteeism is that you go to work, but you're not as productive at your workplace. And this is a well-known phenomenon in patients with sort of chronic diseases. So again, in that same study, you know, 66% of patients said that, you know, because, despite their arthritis and not feeling well, they still pushed through and still went to work. 41% of them said they had difficulty carrying out their work duties. And a third of them said they had decreased productivity at work over the last week. 
and a third of them said they, they had trouble even getting to work, you know, especially if you don't drive, you take public transit. If you had you know, severe arthritis, how are you gonna make it to work? Some jobs, also you need to be standing for a long time. It's really, really challenging for these patients. And sort of brings it back to that second case when I showed you, you know, she's trying to go back to work two hours, four hours at a time, but it's really, really tough for her. A few other patient examples. So this is another young patient. She was diagnosed with a disease called dermatomyositis. Again, sort of like lupus, but you get muscle inflammation, joint pain, fatigue. Um, she was crying when I told her the diagnosis. Um, left, had to leave the, the clinic, came back to me and talked to me afterwards. I'm trying to get her started on medications, and her biggest problem is a combination of depression and anxiety. She, a very, very intelligent girl, went home and did all her research about this disease, comes in with long lists of uh, all the different medications that she's read about and all the different side effects. And my challenge really with treating her is really trying to get her to stay on medication. So we're trying to get her onto some strong medications for her. But I'm gonna bring up this other concept of a nocebo effect. You know, so it's a little bit different than the placebo effect, actually the opposite. So placebo effect is a well-known phenomenon. You give patients in a clinical study, you give them a sugar pill, you tell them this pill is gonna be the best pill, you're gonna take away all your pain, it's gonna cure your disease, and 30% of patients when they take the placebo will have some placebo response, and that's a well-known phenomenon. The opposite is true with the nocebo effect. So they've also done studies where they give people a sugar pill, does nothing, but they tell them, you know, this is, this is powerful medicine, you can get dry eyes, dry mouth, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, hair loss, you know, you can, you can feel depressed, you know, you can tell them all these different side effects, and it's well known that patients will start reporting all these side effects as well. So it's the opposite. So for her, unfortunately, she read through her whole entire list of all the medications and was reporting every single side effect possible to these medications, despite, you know, I, me knowing that a lot of these side effects are, it's probably not possible. You know, some of these side effects take months before you can even develop these side effects. For her, she'd take it for two weeks and say, I cannot take this, Dr. Chin. I need to stop this medicine. And she calls my office every three days or so, and I talk to her, I coach her, I tell her that, you know, we talk about the nocebo effect, trying to get her to really get on these medications. And it's been so challenging because she's delayed her own treatment for, for months now. She keeps going on the medication, stopping, going on it, stopping, asking for this other medicine. I'm emailing her now on a fairly uh, regular basis now. So it's been a really, really big challenge for her to you know, take the medicines. And this is actually something that's actually well described as well. You know, patients who have a baseline history of anxiety, depression, you know, medical adherence is also lower. You know, this is another study. This was actually a, a meta-analysis looking at different studies and seeing it how, much, how many of these patients actually stay on the medicines as prescribed. And they were able to demonstrate patients who were depressed were three times more likely to be non-adherent to the medications. And there's probably a variety of different reasons of why you, you, the patients don't stay on these medications. Uh, this is another patient, patient JS. He's a little bit of an older gentleman, 66-year-old gentleman with uh, inflammatory bowel disease with associated inflammatory arthritis. He's had lots of different surgeries before. He's got knee replacements, back surgery, chronic back pain. He's been on disability for years. He's on, you know, when he was referred to me, he was already on chronic uh, morphine mm -hmm. just to control his pain. Um, every time I see him, he comes into my office, he's got the flattest look on his face and I've suspected that he's had depression for quite some time. And he comes in with his wife and I look at his wife and I can see there's a lot of tension between him and his wife at the same time too, just with their interactions. And I wonder if she could be depressed too. And this is actually also well described. So this was a study, this was actually a study from uh, the greater Vancouver area, but spouse depression in patients, uh, married to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And a it was a questionnaire given to the spouses of these patients who were diagnosed with an inflammatory arthritis. And they're able to correlate, you know, with worsening disease of your spouse, the depressive symptoms in your spouse also increased as well. And, and that makes sense. You know, when your loved one is suffering, not able to work, not able to go for a walk, not able to play with their children, that's going to cause a lot of stress on the relationship. And then probably, you know, financial stress too. You know, when they're not working, they're on disability, now you're the main breadwinner, so that's also really, really tough for patients. So I've given you sort of a lot of examples of sort of patients that I see on sort of a day-to-day -day basis and why these patients have more depression, why these patients have more anxiety. 
Um, it's multifactorial, so there are socioeconomic factors that play into it. There are patient factors, again, gender, age, um, you know, social supports. Do they have anyone else that can actually help them, guide them through? If, do there, is there family in town? And then also disease factors. Like what exactly are we treating? Is it severe osteoarthritis? Is it lupus? Is it inflammatory arthritis? That also plays into it as well, of course. Um, what are some of the challenges that I face when I manage these patients? So again, we know that worsening pain, uh, sort of worsening depression causes worsening pain. They're 30% less likely to respond to treatment. You know, I see this very often. I start getting patients that have depression and anxiety coming back to my office frequently, calling, always trying to make additional follow-up appointments. Well, Dr. Chin, the medicine is not working. My, pain, my joints are really sore. I examine them. I don't find much inflammation. The blood tests are normal. And a lot of it is, you know, I think it's pain amplification. It's depression and anxiety causing worsening pain. And sometimes you get trapped into this dose escalation. You know, they're telling me that the, the medicine's not working, so we keep getting them onto another medicine, another medicine, and we're cycling through so many different medications or escalating their treatment, and then they get side effects from the medications as well. That makes them more depressed or more hopeless. They stop taking their medicines, so it's really, really difficult um, to really get these patients treated. Um, there's a sense of hopelessness in some of these patients. You know, nothing works. You know, that's the other thing. You know, people who are depressed are more hopeless. You know, they, they have that nocebo effect. They start taking the medicine. They don't believe it's going to work. So they don't believe it's work, it's not gonna work. You know, it's the exact opposite. You know, you have, there has to be some degree of buy-in to the treatment that we're offering. Um, lots of different sort of stresses as well, like we talked about earlier. So how can we manage depression and anxiety? So I think the first thing is really identifying it. You know, it's obviously really easy when the patients come and tell me, hey, I'm depressed, like, okay, no brainer. Then I obviously need to talk to them about it, refer them to, uh, psychiatrist or psychologist or get them to talk to the family doctor but I think I'm missing a lot of it to be honest you know in my day-to-day -day practice and you know when I was doing this talk I started thinking about you know how I can improve my practice and I think I need to sometimes just be more uh, upfront and ask patients when I suspect it like are you depressed how is your mood how are you feeling today you know I think and I, if I'm able to actually capture that and get them to actually talk about it, I can actually make a change and get them to talk to their family doctor or make them refer to appropriate um, uh, allied health members to help me manage this as well. So, um, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, although some days I feel like I am, but I do need help. So in summary, you know, chronic pain is very, very common. Rheumatic disease is probably one of the number one causes of chronic pain and disability. Patients have a with rheumatic diseases have an increased prevalence of anxiety and depression. Patients who are anxious and depressed are diff more difficult to treat. Many, many different causes for why patients can, can be anxious and depressed like I've illustrated earlier. Um, and we need really help. You know, it's a multidisciplinary team. You know, me as the rheumatologist, I can't address all the issues at the time. So I definitely need help with the family doctors and the, the, uh, the psychiatrists and psychologists. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chin. We are going to take a quick five minute break right now and so everybody can stretch and we will be back in five minutes with Dr. LePage, a psychologist.
Okay, if we could get everybody to return back to their seats. After, after the fact, after the presentation? Yeah, we can send them out to you after the presentation, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Did you, if you registered online, um, we can automatically send uh, it to the group if you want, or if you're not sure if you have given our email address, just give it to our volunteers outside the room and they can email it out to you. Alrighty, so now um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. LePage. Dr. LePage is a registered psychologist in BC with a clinical practice in the area of chronic pain, illness, and disability to patients suffering from a variety of medical and pain conditions, brain injuries, depressive anxiety, and stress-related disorders. Dr. LePage holds an appointment as adjunct professor in the Division of Rheumatology in the Department of Medicine and clinical professor in the pain medicine program in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. She has held positions of divisional psychologist in the Pacific Region RCMP and acting chief psychologist at national headquarters of the RCMP over the past 10 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. LePage. Hi there. Uh, try to bear with me a bit because I have a bit of a cold, so my, uh, you might lose my voice every now and then. Um, so we're going to be talking about, more specifically, obviously, the psychological factors that are related to chronic pain. So just to start, I, like to, I always like to start this with what is the definition of pain. Um, and so according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, uh, uh, as defined by Dr. Harold Mursky, who is a psychiatrist, uh, the definition of just pain is the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage uh, or described in terms of such damage. Uh, and so th the reason why I go through this is because when we're defining pain, there is already a we're lo already looking at it's not just a physical experience, it's, a, it's an emotional experience. So if you've ever, I think everybody here has experienced pain, uh, you know, in their life. Uh, and if you can imagine experience pain, experiencing pain without actually experiencing any emotion, uh, I don't know if that that's possible. So uh, going on from there, uh, looking at the pain cycle. So generally speaking, when one has chronic pain, um, and it's unmanaged symptoms, and they may develop, uh, uh, symptoms may lead individuals into a sort of a downward spiral uh, when they're not managed. So looking at the disease uh, process, uh, tense, you end up off, often an automatic reaction to that is tensing your muscles. You feel stressed, uh, fear, anxiety, frustration, uh, depression, and fatigue. And so it's a sort of a vicious cycle as to what happens when one is experiencing chronic pain. Uh, acute pain, uh, very different in terms of you usually have sort of an idea as to when the end is in sight, but with chronic pain, uh, there often is no end in sight. No doctor can tell you, tell you when it's gonna be over, and so the cycle can, can begin. Uh, so in terms of understanding uh, pain, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing that screen. But um, uh, normal pain, again, has sort of an alarm system. Uh, and you, so it responds to body tissue damage. So when you experience pain, normally it's a signal that there is some damage. So if you've dropped something heavy on your foot or cut your hand, something like that. So the, the pain is an alarm signal that something has been damaged in your body. Um, however, uh, pain responses may not always accurately reflect uh, the, the what's actually happening in your body. So for example, um, if you have a paper cut, you know that you can uh, feel severe pain when you have, have a paper cut. Um, and other times you may have uh, caused damage to your body, but you don't actually feel the damage. So I don't know if anyone has actually ever seen the movie 127 Hours. Has anyone seen that movie? Okay, so in that movie, uh, there's a fellow who's uh, hiking and rock climbing, and he somehow gets himself into a predicament where he gets his arm stuck and wedged in a rock. Um, and he's all by himself hiking, 
he, uh, and if he doesn't un get his uh, arm unstuck, he's going to die, basically. So what he does is he eventually severs his own arm and makes his way to safety. Um, I mean, it's hard to imagine someone doing that, and this is based on a true story. So this person literally severed their own arm with whatever tools they had in their backpack, made their way to safety, and then collapsed. Uh, so our body can do amazing things sometimes, and so clearly there was a, a huge amount of damage to this person's body, but our adrenaline, uh, the rest of our system kicks in, and somehow we often can end up making our way to safety, um, and then uh, there's sort of a rush of pain, and we're overwhelmed by it. Um, so... Uh, so uh, the other issue re regarding the nervous system is our, our nervous system can often be altered according to the input that we receive. I, is my mic working? Still? Okay. Uh, so um, it, can, it can be overly sensitized, and so we can feel pain. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I didn't touch it. hear me now? Nope. No sound? <laughs> Technical difficulties? <laughs> can you hear me without the mic? Because I can, oh, here we go. There we go. We got it. <laughs> now I'm going to give you all a hearing problem. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so our system can be oversensitized, uh, leading to an increase in the pain that we actually feel sometimes, and so it's oversensitized. Uh, some of the cases that often are cited for that are things like fibromyalgia and a lot of different types of chronic pain conditions where you feel pain you know, almost constantly, but nothing's actually occurring in the body that would suggest that there's any more damage occurring. Um, so in some of those conditions, uh, you feel pain on a relatively regular basis whether you're, whether you're doing anything or doing nothing. Uh, and other times we can actually calm down our pain by trying to reduce it from a variety of ways in terms of how we feel. And we'll get into that into a little more detail. So we can learn techniques that can help us calm uh, the pain signals. Um, so pain and perception is very important. Um, uh, pain is not just about the amount of uh, tissue damage or the degree of pathology. Again, so if you think about something like a paper cut, you have a fairly minor injury, uh, but you feel extreme pain. So, and again, there are other times where I know that uh, some of the rheumatologists that I've worked with have seen people's x-rays and they've said, yeah, I don't know how you're even moving the way you are based on your x-rays uh, and the amount of pain that you're reporting, but somehow they either aren't reporting, they aren't feeling the pain as much as it would suggest in the x-ray. Um, so again, tissue damage doesn't always equal what level of pain and disability one is going to feel. Um, so it's, it's also about sort of the unique way each person experiences pain. So we all experience it differently. We have our different perceptions about pain and illness. What we've learned from our families, what, you know, our culture, our, our personality, um, the social groups that we're exposed to. So, you know, as we grow, we learn different ways of how to deal with pain and illness. Um, and that's all part of our pain experience as well. Um, and so previous pain experiences also will help build as, you know, what we do when we have uh, more injury or illnesses. Um, and our beliefs and emotions also play a big role. So uh, one of the areas in which we can really cause ourselves a lot of problems is when we catastrophize the situations that we're in. So psychologists will look at what perceptions do you have about your condition? Um, are, do you, are you ruminating about it a lot? Are you feeling helpless? Are you magnifying the pain-related symptoms and experience that you're having? Because those are all going to lead you likely down the road to depression and anxiety. So how do you perceive your pain and your, uh, your perceived disability? So beliefs can influence perceptions of pain. Um, they, uh, there's been a lot of research to show that it actually predicts people's level of disability um, and ability to return to work. 
uh, and reductions in catastrophizing beliefs so that you know we learn how to uh, have a more balanced perspective of how the pain is affecting us um, also predicts decreased pain and disability. So here's just sort of a cartoon example of somebody who has pain and eventually as they continue to ruminate they see themselves in a wheelchair, uh, the family's telling them off and nobody wants to be around them anymore. Um, so there are other kinds of dysfunctional beliefs that we can have that are also going to change how we deal with our situation, with our, with our chronic pain. So uh, another example would be the all or none type of situation. So if I can't sit for more than two hours, I can't work at all. So it's all or nothing. Um, fortune telling, my kids will never be proud of me again because I can't do the things I used to with them. Uh, disqualifying the positive, that's often what happens when people are depressed. They will filter out all of the positive things, even neutral things, and focus only on the negative, which is supporting their depression. So one good day doesn't mean that I will have other good days. Uh, uh, another one, often the, a lot of uh, my patients, uh, they feel useless, and they tell themselves that they're useless. You know, I, I can't do all the things I used to do, I'm, I'm useless now. Um, and, uh, another one is the mind reading, and um, we we all do this uh, from time to time anyway. But in the sort of pain area, can uh, you know they can't can't they tell that I need help cleaning the house? So I need that my family to or you know my loved ones to uh, be able to tell what I need without me having to communicate that to them. And that's also not true, of course. We all know that even when you don't have pain, we can't mind read. Um, and then the last example is the should statements. I should be able to exercise the way I used to, or I should be able to garden the way I used to, uh, I should be able to play sports the way I used to. All of those should statements really keep us feeling pretty bad about ourselves, and they're not really realistic. So the other thing that, uh, that was brought up earlier was that uh, it's invisible. You can feel invalidated by the process. Uh, by the medical process sometimes. So if you've gone to a number of different specialists, they may be giving you different bits of input and you start to get confused as to what you should or shouldn't be doing. What's the best course of action? Um, that, that, can be, uh, that can be confusing in and of itself. Um, it can be challenging to get the support that you need as well. I've had a lot of um, uh, patients, uh, they don't even know what an occupational therapist is, and they're really struggling with a lot of things that they need to do in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and so uh, sometimes I'll call the, their family doctor and, and suggest that they refer them to an occupational therapist, which is sometimes covered by people's extended health and medical plans, and they can do wonders for helping people be able to do, get back to some of the activities that they used to do with some of the uh, sort of uh, um, uh, devices that occupational therapists can offer. Um, and then the third thing is communicating your pain can be problematic. So uh, sometimes we don't want to communicate, we don't want to upset um, our family, we don't want them to worry, so we try not to communicate it. But then perhaps on the other hand, we may be doing the mind reading thing about they should know that I need help with this. So it can get to be a bit of a vicious cycle with that as well. Um, and so the uh, what do you tell others, uh, that's another huge issue. And again, if you're trying to um, not upset family members and not continue to focus on your pain, what do you tell family members? So you may worry about how much to tell others or what to tell others. Um, beliefs that you must tell everything to be believed. And I've had several patients where they have very complex pain conditions. It may not be as straightforward as rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. And they try to explain to their family and loved ones what they're experiencing and uh, they're not getting it. Uh, so then they feel invalidated. You know, how come my family doesn't understand? Why aren't they trying? And so sometimes, again, other people will think that they know what you're going through and they'll go, oh, I had that before and I was able to get back to work. So why aren't you able to do that? You know, I, I don't understand why you're not working. So again, more invalidation. Um, feeling judged regardless of their explanation. So they can go through all the links that they can possibly. They can find articles on the web. They can get their doctor to talk to family members and still 
it's not necessarily that you're going to get them to understand things the way you would like them to. Um, so sometimes it's not uh, you. It's not helpful to keep trying. You uh, end up frustrating yourself in the end. So trying to find a balance between what you uh, need to tell them and going sort of beyond that in trying to explain a situation that again not everybody's going to understand. Um, and pain and identity. So again, this was touched on a little earlier. Um, what has pain changed? Has it changed the way that you do activities, the type of activities you do, uh, how you view yourself, or how others view you? So just a couple of examples in my work uh, with, in the RCMP for 10 years, I've dealt with members who were no longer able to work in an operational capacity. So that means if they have been injured, um, whether it's physical or uh, psychological injuries, they are not able to carry a gun and drive a police vehicle. If they aren't able to carry a gun, they can't wear their uniform. And if they can't wear the uniform, they can't drive a police vehicle. And so if they've been a, an RCMP member, a police uh, officer for, let's say, 10 or 20 years, and that's uh, a major identification as to who they are, and they no longer can even appear as though they are belong, who are they? Um, I also saw a, um, an Olympic athlete uh, locally here who was no longer able to do her sport, and she was only in her late 20s. She'd had several uh, falls in her sport, concussions, and no longer able to do it. Um, she still was of the age where she should have been able to continue to uh, compete, but she couldn't. And so again, who who is she? So, uh, you know, those are sort of extreme examples. Another uh, more... Um, uh, Example related to osteoarthritis, I had a, a patient who had osteoarthritis, was um, in a motor vehicle accident. He was crossing the street and somebody turned and hit him, so he was a pedestrian being hit. Um, he had a family, two children and a wife. Um, his injuries were so severe that he was having difficulty walking. So I think that the, the slide that you saw earlier of the uh, person with osteoarthritis um, uh, it was osteo or, or ankylosing spondylitis where they continued to uh, degenerate in terms of their ability to walk and that. Anyway, he was using a cane. He couldn't stand up straight. He couldn't do much of anything, but he was the person in the, in the house uh, originally who was the, uh, you know, trying to get the kids into sports and he was the cook in the family. He loved cooking, um, but he could no longer really do those activities the way he used to. So he saw himself as being useless. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, his, as his son got a bit older, he wanted to be able to, again, get his son involved in basketball and tennis and things like that as he was doing with the family. Um, but he, again, couldn't do that. So we talked about different ways of getting him m more involved in it from the perspective that he actually could do. So we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. How do, how do you get there? But, um, and, you know, it was two years of treatment before he finally started moving on and finding other ways of adapting. So, um, so part, and part of that has to do with acceptance. So uh, what, is it, what is acceptance? A lot of people are afraid that if they accept their pain, that means they are in the disabled role that they're ill and that they're gonna be sort of pushed off to the side, sort of the, the stereotypical view of that. So what is acceptance? It's not resigning oneself to pain, illness, and suffering. So you're not resigning yourself to it. Pain isn't gonna take over your life. It's not taking on the role of the patient or the disabled person. Um, it's not giving up on pleasurable activities or interests, um, but it is acknowledging the reality of the, of the situation that you're in. It's also uh, quitting efforts that are not working. Again, you may have experienced this where people keep trying the same thing over and over and it's not working. So it's acknowledging this isn't working, I need to try something else. It's also selecting workable strategies that are going to help you get back to meaningful goals. Um, and it's also, uh, acceptance really is moment to moment choices. So what's gonna work for you in that moment, that day, uh, uh, rather than sort of again going back to what used to work that's no longer working. So aiming for acceptance is trying to adopt a realistic perspective of life with chronic pain and how it's changed your functioning. So um, aligning basically your cognitions and emotions with your body, with how your body is functioning and listening to that. Um, functional abilities are not an all or none proposition. 
um, as the, the fellow I mentioned earlier, who if he couldn't uh, cook things the way he used to, he just didn't want to be in the kitchen at all. So he used to bake bread, he used to do all kinds of wonderful meals, but if he couldn't do it the way he used to, he just wasn't going to try anything. Um, so it's trying to not do the all or none proposition. Um, so you know, looking at your sitting tolerances, your modification of your environment, which is again where an occupational therapist may be helpful. And then the third is what do you have control of? So you may not be able to eliminate your pain, but you have influence of your, over your pain. Um, and how do you try to influence your pain? And so again, when uh, earlier we were talking about depression and anxiety and how that often increases people's reported pain levels, so that's where you have some influence of your pain level. Now, just to kind of go on a, a side thing here in terms of aiming for acceptance, does anybody know what the animal here is in the picture? It's a sloth, right? Um, I just, I happened to be at a conference two weeks ago in Costa Rica and uh, we had a really great tour guide who gave us very good educational talks and so I have to share my sloth story with you because it really fits in with the acceptance. So I don't know if anybody knows much about sloths, um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about their reproductive life. And um, in any talk, you're probably not going to remember a lot of what I said, but you'll remember this story. <laughs> so sloths apparently have uh, only uh, have their reproductive re their reproductive cycle is only good for one week every year, so one week a year, and the female can reproduce. She can well, she can basically mate to reproduce, and so uh, the males out there have one week to find her. Okay, so they've got one week to find the female, and. Um, and so it takes them, I don't know how long it takes them to find her, sometimes they're too late, uh, but apparently when the male does find the female sloth, um, it takes them approximately 48 hours to find a comfortable position in which to reproduce. And apparently sometimes they fall asleep while they're trying to find a good position. <laughs> They'll fall asleep, they'll wake up again, they'll keep trying, they'll fall asleep, they'll wake up again. So within that 48 hours, eventually, they, you know, they uh, do the act in terms of being able to reproduce, um, and it's all over in a matter of seconds. The male leaves, and that's it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, so I just thought that you might enjoy that, because, you know, again, earlier we were talking about how chronic pain can affect people's ability to do things. So, and I have a lot of patients, again, who uh, their pain has obviously affected their, their intimate life with their partner. And uh, so if they aren't able to do things the way they, they used to and it becomes too difficult, they just push that aside completely. So, um, so sometimes it may be helpful to put things in perspective and think about the sloth. <laughs> 48 hours just to find a comfortable position. <laughs> The other, the other little funny thing about them is apparently the female only has one baby, one baby when she reproduces, and uh, they live up in the trees. So if the baby falls, which they sometimes do, she'll go down and get it and come back up again. If the baby falls a second time, she'll go back down and get it. If it falls a third time, it's on its own. <laughs> so, so that's it. Don't fall more than twice if you're the baby sloth, because you're done. <laughs> okay. So, yep, it's not, oh, we want to stay on the sloth picture. Can we uh, advance the slide? Okay, so addressing the emotional and psychological um, impact of pain. So again, there's stress and worry related to what's happening, when's it going to be over, how am I going to do the things I need to do. Uh, there's the depression, the irritability that often sets in feeling helpless, um, fear that the pain is going to increase if you do anything differently or try to exercise, um, and then, of course, the relationship issues. So the management of pain. So first, of course, it's important, as we talked about the acceptance, to start listening to your body. You must listen to it. Ignoring it isn't going to work because the pain will eventually win. Um, so listening to your body, so you won't eliminate the pain, but you can learn uh, to reset the alarm level of your pain. Um, learning to the, the coping strategies, so there are physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral coping strategies. You can get at your pain from all different perspectives, and we'll do some examples. 
Um, so the main uh, uh, approach that psychologists take is cognitive behavior therapy. I don't know if you've heard about it before, but it's um, the most successful, the most supported by the research. Um, and so for chronic pain and illness, it's uh, our automatic thoughts can create impressions of illness that negatively impact our coping. And so uh, what CBT does is it focuses on the cognitive processes that underlie those beliefs. And we try to uh, you know, look at the behaviors that need to be stopped and trying to look at coping behaviors that need to be reinforced. So changing the uh, behavior so that we are actually uh, working with, with good behaviors, behaviors that are helping you, not ones that are actually holding you back. And so what you think and what you do really does affect um, how you feel. The definition of CBT again? Yep. Um, so it's, uh, oops, that the uh, that automatic th thoughts create an impression um, of uh, the illness that negatively impacts our coping. So what we do is look at the beliefs. Uh, we often have automatic beliefs that we're not even really aware of. Um, so it's the psychologists are looking at what are those beliefs that you have, how is that affecting your behavior and how you feel, and how can we change that? Are those thoughts in line with reality, um, with the facts of the situation? And most of the time, they're not. And so we're trying to bring the facts back in, trying to bring a more realistic perspective back in, and having you approach it from that, uh, from that angle so that you have more helpful beliefs that help you move forward rather than holding you back. Is that clear? Okay. So, um, so the goals are to become more functional despite the pain, um, to not equate chronic pain with disability. Again, I think one in nine people have chronic pain, so there are a lot of people out there with chronic pain, obviously varying levels. Um, pain uh, acceptance leads to less pain, generally. Uh, it leads to less pain distress and depression as well, and lower disability and increased functioning. So uh, when there is pain acceptance, in which we talked about the acceptance earlier, um, these are the things that it, it can lead to. So uh, uh, this sort of the way of restructuring thoughts, um, looking at you know your, your automatic thought may be my symptoms are out of control. Um, is that a fact or is that a reality? So are they, are they really out of control or have you done things to, or, or, or is there anything about your situation that has created more pain? So have you overdone it? Um, are you in a situation where um, you could do things to alter your pain level? Are you feeling stressed? So, or is your pain really out of control? So are, there are things I can do to help my symptoms. That's a fact. Um, I'm not able to sit for more than two hours, so I can't work. So, you know, again, it depends on what work you're looking at. Can you not work at all, or are there other types of work you can do? Are there other ways that you can modify your work? So I can try job modifications that allow me to sit and stand. Again, that's where an occupational therapist may come in handy in terms of looking at what you do and how you do it. And then the last example is one good day doesn't mean I will have others. So again, one good day can bring hope that there may that there may be others. So again, it's sort of how are you, how are you looking at the situation um, and what thoughts are you focusing on? And your, th your thoughts, of course, will lead to how you feel and that will lead to what you do, right? So if you feel that one good day doesn't mean I will have others, um, you will become more depressed and you will probably likely do less and not try some of the things that you might have wanted to try. So symptom management, so some passive strategies is, of course, the acceptance of disability, avoiding uh, activity, medication reliance, catastrophizing, staying home, isolating yourself, or hiring home care. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't hire home care, but it's just part of what you might do to just completely hibernate. Um, and isolate. So some active strategies may be trying to challenge the beliefs that you have about your pain and how disabled or limited you, you feel. Um, uh, exercise, uh, uh, and I think that, I know that the rheumatologist that I've uh, worked with, exercise is good for everybody. Some level of it is good. Um, and so again, you need to find out what that level is for you, but um, I've never, you know, being totally sedentary isn't good for anything. Um, relaxation and yoga can be very helpful, problem solving approaches, pacing activities, socializing and trying to do some chores or some work, um, again, to what level you are able to.
<clears throat> sleep and chronic pain, uh, that's one thing that hasn't been talked about yet. Usually sleep is affected. Uh, when you're not able to be comfortable physically um, or if you're worrying a lot and or depressed. So um, those things can also affect your pain level too. So what are some things? Sleep problems can be related to pain, anxiety, um, inactivity. Um, sleep medication should be considered for, m for moderate to severe um, sleep problems to get you back into a regular healthy sleep routine. And then after that, as you're developing healthier routines and uh, sleep strategies, you can then fade the medication out. Um, so sleep hygiene should be reviewed in terms of what are your sleep routines in a day, in, sorry, in, in an evening. Are you um, doing something that um, gets you, you know, uh, not sleepy at night? So are you watching your favorite show that's, you know, a, a really exciting show and then you try to go to bed or, or doing something like that? Or are you doing wind down activities? Are you, and are you going to bed the around the same time every night? Are you eating a big meal before bed? Because that, of course, is going to interfere with sleep as well. There are many, many things that should be looked at to see if what you're doing, is it interfering with sleep or not? Um, Basically, we go into a mini hibernation when we go to sleep at night. So our breathing slows down, we, we feel more relaxed, our body temperature drops a little bit, um, and we become, uh, our, our muscle tension is released. So if we're doing anything to um, change those things, we're interfering with our sleep. Um, and then the sleep strategies. And so here's a number of websites that for those people who aren't able to go to a psychologist or um, waiting for a long time to see a psychiatrist because there are long wait times as well for psychiatry, um, there are several websites. So Pain BC has a lot of stuff on uh, self-management. Um, Canadian Pain Coalition, Mary Pack Arthritis, of course, arthritis.ca. Um, uh, bounce, uh, sorry, for Anxiety BC, it's actually now become Anxiety Canada, but if you use that website, you'll get to Anxiety Canada. They have a lot of really good self-help stuff to help you with anxiety. Um, and uh, depression, uh, bouncebackbc.ca. And then for sleep, these were two um, sleep websites that I found helpful. Well, one was Anxiety BC, and the second one is a website out of the UK called Mood Juice. Uh, they're both too. And there's, uh, there's a ton of apps out there. There's like a Calm app, a White Noise app. There's a lot of apps that have music and different types of sounds that you might want to use to help you sleep. And just to sort of wrap it up, um, and if all else that I've said doesn't work, um, your dog puppy therapist, <laughs> if you can't read the bottom, I'll read it for you. It says, my, therapist, uh, my therapy is quite simple. I wag my tail and lick your face until you feel good about yourself again. Any questions? Yep. Pertaining to the diet, um, there are, um, I'm not an expert on the, in the area of diet, but I believe that the Arthritis Society has um, information on their website related to diet and inflammation. So there are, there are, um, uh, there are nutritional tips related to uh, sort of anti-inflammatory diets. So omega-3s, uh, you know, fish, um, I'm not sure what they all are, but there are several foods that are supposed to be helpful in, uh, for an anti-inflammatory process. Um, I don't know. That I don't know. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. LePage. Uh, we will take another quick five-minute break so everybody can stretch, and then we will come back and hear from Dr. Seeley, who will speak to us.
All righty, we will get started with our final speaker. So now I'm very happy to introduce to you today Dr. Rob Seeley, who will discuss arthritis and medical cannabis benefits and side effects for the management of arthritis-related mental health issues. Dr. Seeley is an active member of the Peer Sharing Group Physicians for Medical Cannabis, along with the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, the International Cannabinoid Research Society, and the International Association for Cannabis as Medicine. Dr. Seeley has been involved in both the clinical and research aspects of medical cannabis since 2001. Numerous specialists have referred patients to Dr. Seeley for the consideration of medical cannabis management in conditions that may not have responded to standard therapy. Sensing a void in knowledge among his peers regarding the use of medical cannabis in clinical practice, Dr. Seeley has traveled extensively across North America as one of the few instructors in this field of medicine. He's actually leaving tonight to head to Australia to do a, a talk there as well. So thank you so much for stopping here and speaking to this group. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Seeley. Thank you very much, and uh, I welcome you all. I know it's, uh, I was gonna say it's a snow day, but it was more like a snow hour, I think, that happened this morning. And for those at home uh, watching from a webinar, I imagine there's a couple million, I heard. Uh, you can't see us in the room, but I think I, I've counted there's about 3,000 of us in the room, so you're missing out. It's a really robust crew, and uh, I learned a lot. This is uh, really depressing, actually, this afternoon. I've been sitting over there, and I thought, that's all we're talking about is mental health and depression, and it's not really something to whip you up the crowd frenzy, but I did learn a few things, uh, Dr. Chen being local across the street. I'm from overseas, I'm from Victoria. It was a nice little uh, BC ferry ride over and sunshine breakfast and this sort of thing. Also, I uh, learned that I'm uh, actually probably related to a sloth. Um, <laughs> with so a lot of people say, well, how, well, not a lot of people like Dr. Chin. My mother wanted to know, how did I get into you know, a wasted career in medicine? go from family practice into uh, cannabis. I'm a you know, pot doctor. How, how did that happen? Well, it happened because of patients like you uh, that just sat across from me years ago and said, Doc, what about sativa? What about indica? And I'm like, my eyes glazed over just like their eyes were. And I said, what are you talking about? I had no idea these plant varieties and all. And this, they were talking about year 2000, 2001 when cannabis was first legalized medically here. Um, and I had a patient over in Victoria with arthritis, severe arthritis of the lower back, and she was on a long-term disability. She was on opiates. Her quality of life was horrible, and I was filling out disability forms every six months. And she said to me, she said, Rob, cannabis is going to be legalized. Can you go ahead and authorize me for it? And I, again, I had no idea what she was talking about. So I learned from her. And what motivated me was she got back to work and I didn't have to fill out those forms anymore. But I dabbled in cannabis over the years, not personally. I dabbled with my patients in cannabis over the years. And then the second thing that happened to me, I was a co-host of a radio show called Wise Quacks. How many people heard Wise Quacks? It was right, oh my goodness, there's four, five people, because six people, okay. There's obviously, there's a delay, there's seven. Uh, for those people on the webinar, there was about 50,000 people put their hands up. But no, we were on the air for about eight years, right across uh, Canada. And we would answer questions in kind of a comical way, as you can see, I tend to do that. But if it was a question on asthma or hypertension or diabetes, we had the answer, we eventually gave the answer. But when patients would call in about medical cannabis, we just joked about it. We didn't have an answer. And then people would say, well, what about this study? What about what I read on you know, Dr. Google? We would just joke it off. So part of our show as well, we would bring in medical guests, like celebrities from different parts of the world that usually had some sort of disorder that they were at a cause celeb. And so we thought, we should bring in a celebrity to talk about cannabis. We combed the corners of the earth trying to find who that celebrity would be. And the only person, this is quite a few years ago, but the only person we could find at that time was Tommy Chong, right? Cheech and Chong. So he was down in LA. We lined it up with his agent, you know, the day before and all the rest of it. Okay, Tommy, we're going to call you at 2 o'clock. The phone rings, 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 rings. Okay, so now we've got an hour with no Tommy Chong. We finally got a hold of him that evening. He was out tending his gardens or whatever he was tending it, right? But that's just that just shows you that the the level of knowledge was really lacking. 
So I said to my partner in crime at the time, I said, you know what, let's look at this and see what is it that people are doing and is there evidence behind this? And that's what got us interested in and, and what's put me off into a different career. 28 years in family practice, now I do medical cannabis full time and I get to travel and talk to kind people like you. So um, I would like to thank, by the way, uh, not only you folks here in the room, the, the 30,000 of you, but the the Arthritis Center, which has been working behind the scenes for months and months getting ready for today's event. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank a sponsor called Canamed. They're a, they're a cannabis supplier, a licensed producer under the realm of Aurora Cannabis, who helped to bring me over on the BC ferries. So thank you to, the, to everybody that's uh, made this happen. Now, I also want to mention that I guess this is a, a series of lectures that have been happening. Um, and there was a Dr. Spooner who I happened to watch his YouTube video. If you get a chance from the previous uh, series, I would highly rec don't use the word highly, Rob, when you're talking about cannabis. Um, I would suggest that you uh, watch Dr. Spooner's video and he talked about cannabis. And so I wanted to make sure I didn't repeat a lot of things that he talked about. How many people saw Dr. Spooner speak before about cannabis? One, uh, 100 and, okay, okay, so two, 200 people in the room here have seen Dr. Spooner. Well, okay, so I was going to not talk so much about what he's talked about, but if you haven't heard his talk, maybe I'll fill in some of the gaps. One of the things, though, I always like to know is get to know your audience, right? You should know who you're speaking to. So this is pretty private in here, and those people at home, of course, on the webinar, um, it's pretty confidential, but don't look at your partners. I want you to put your hands up if you have cannabis in your system right now. Everybody, you're looking, you looked around, you look back, you look backwards. For those of you at home, nobody here in the room put their hands up, but it's a trick question. And that's the Dr. Spooner question. The, no cannabis lecture can be complete. In fact, I think it's illegal to have a cannabis lecture if you don't talk about the endocannabinoid system. Have you heard about the endocannabinoid system? Okay, so a lot of people are either sound asleep, or, or there's one person back there. Don't worry if you haven't heard about the endocannabinoid system. They don't teach this in medical school yet. The endocannabinoid system didn't exist as we knew it. It's, it has existed forever, but we didn't even know about it until 1992. When I went through medical school, hadn't even heard about it. And they're still not teaching us about the endocannabinoid system. But the endocannabinoid system, you need to know it to understand how cannabis could potentially work for various conditions. The endocannabinoid system runs the show. It's the balancing, the homeostasis the mechanism that keeps us in check. So if there's any sort of insult or stimulus that bothers us, our body has the potential to create its own cannabis-like substance to say, hey, hey, don't like what you're telling me, shut her down. It's a feedback mechanism. The sort of catch-all term is eat, sleep, relax, protect, and forget. It is everywhere in our body. And I'm gonna to have to show you how it works. I'm gonna spend probably about three or four hours just on this one slide. I'm, okay, good, you, you caught that. No, I'm not. But I've actually gone to conferences where they spent three days talking about the endocannabinoid system. Because again, it's abundant in our body, these receptors, there's called CB1 and CB2 receptors, but they're everywhere. And actually how they got founded was actually kind of interesting. Raphael Machulam, who uh, founded THC, the stuff that makes you high in the marijuana plant, he founded in 1964. So he said, okay, well that's interesting. We found this component. Where in the brain does it make people high? And he found these receptors in the brain. But then these receptors were everywhere else. And it doesn't make sense that our bones and our spleen, our spinal column, would have receptors for something that makes us high. And that's when they started to search. They said, these receptors must be there for some other reason. There must be chemicals that our own body makes to use those exact same receptors. And lo and behold, they founded the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system works like a domino. It's one nerve cell to the next nerve cell. It sends a message from one nerve over and it knocks over the next domino and goes down a chain reaction. However, the body's pretty smart. It has a sensor and it decides I don't like the stimulus that you're sending me, whether it's pain, whether it's inflammation and arthritis, whether it's anxiety, whether it's a seizure and epilepsy, a lot of factors. Our body protects itself by sending chemicals back 
They're called anandamide and 2-AG. They're finding a few other ones. But they're endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, that go back to the first domino or neuron and say, quiet down. The problem is our body doesn't always make enough, especially if the pain and inflammation is too great. So then that domino can start to tip over and go and go and go. What's interesting, what fits into those receptors, you'll see, and that's where the cannabis comes along. So these receptors are abundant, as I said, throughout the entire body. But what's important why we're talking about mental health and, and pain today is where they are in the brain, okay, and where they're not in the brain. They're in the parts of the brain that have to do with our movement and our learning and our memory and our coordination. Did I say memory? I'm kidding. I said that. Uh, but it also has to do with the amygdala, the part of the brain that has to do with stress and emotion and pain, how we perceive pain. And these receptors are all through that area of the brain. There is abundant, abundant research that shows us how important our endocannabinoid system is. I just pulled out one research paper because I think it's kind of quirky, but it kind of tells us how important it is in mental health. When people get PTSD, you mentioned about PTSD, you know, why do some people get PTSD and other people don't? Well, this was a study done on World Trade Center survivors, the 9-11. And it was, had to do with the University of Calgary and New York University. They looked at and they measured all sorts of things, these people's blood pressures, their shoe size, everything. And the only thing that they found different in those people, the half of the people that got PTSD, was they were low in, in, in uh, 2-AG, which is one of our endocannabinoids. The other people who didn't get PTSD, they had normal levels of 2-AG. They had a functioning endocannabinoid system. That's huge. We, need, we have never known what was the actual biochemical cause of PTSD before. It's all a disruption of endocannabinoids. What causes fibromyalgia? Right? We don't, nobody knows, right? Nobody, we always say, well, it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. You might have some tender spots in the muscles and all the rest of it. What causes irritable bowel syndrome? What causes migraines? Guess what they're thinking? Ethan Russo has done all these postulations on mice, hopefully m mice and men. We can go, uh, go beyond that. And saying that, okay, what is it that's deficient in these people? In fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, he's been able to demonstrate there's a lowered endocannabinoid level. Pretty interesting, right? People don't make enough of their own endocannabinoids. Wait a minute, what can we do to supplement those endocannabinoids? If we can't make enough or that stimulus is too great, there's different things that fit into those receptors. Again, there's our own body's endogenous endocannabinoids, our own cannabis-like substance. There's synthetic cannabinoids. One that's been around for a long time is called sesame or nabilone but it's just THC, which you remember what Dr. Machulam found was that's what makes people high. Then there's the plant-based cannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids that fit in those same receptors that are sitting there in our body, all over our body. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you about plant cannabinoids, and this is actually a picture of my basement. So I've been doing a lot of research. <laughs> it's the female cannabis plant, and when you look at it under electron microscope, at the end of the bud, there's these things, these juicy things called trichomes. Within the trichomes are the cannabinoids, okay? They mimic what our body's trying to do. Right now, they've identified about 105 of them. There's other parts of the plant called terpenes. Terpenes have their own properties. They give it the aroma of the plant, but they also have sedating properties or anti-inflammatory properties or anti-anxiety properties. Oh, there's flavonoids, there's antioxidants. This is a plant that has almost 500 parts to it. It's a very robust plant. What I'm gonna talk a little bit about is the cannabinoids that we know about. Now this is, I call it the wheel of fortune, but the one o'clock position, that's the Cheech and Chong one, Delta 9 THC. So THC gives us the munchies, right? It stimulates appetite. It's a good pain reliever and anti-nauseant, okay? Also can help us sleep. So it has some benefits, but the rate limiting factor is it makes us high. The psychoactivity, it can impair us. Well, we thought that, you know, again, back in the 60s, we thought that that was the only component of the plant that did anything. Well, lo and behold, we're peeling apart the plant and finding these other cannabinoids. The big juicy part at the bottom is CBD or cannabidiol. OK, 
Okay, you've heard of cannabidiol. Everybody seems to have heard about cannabidiol now. It's non-psychoactive. You can take it till the cows come home. You, you won't get impaired, okay? It's an anti-inflammatory. It's a pain reliever, anti-anxiety, okay? So also it's the one that the kids use, Charlotte's Web, the oil for kids with intractable epilepsy. So CBD is a very great cannabinoid medicine. Uh, the key is, is it enough for pain? So sometimes what we'll do is we'll try CBD for most people, but if it's not adequate for pain, we'll add some THC. But make sure there's enough CBD to counteract the psychoactivity of THC. So it's compounding. It's taking the parts of the plant that you need and making it bearable, getting help without getting high. Recreational, they don't want the CBD, right? It's a bummer, it's a downer, it's a waste. They want the THC. For medical purposes, for arthritis, we want the CBD, but sometimes we add some THC, especially if the pain's too great or people aren't sleeping at nighttime. So CBD may be in the daytime, maybe a combination of CBD and THC at nighttime. Ah, how much do you take? So, she, so your friend is a pusher, basically, right? <laughs> Yeah, right, okay, well don't eat her brownies. Well, well, I'll show you the dosage. So cannabis has been around for a really long time, right? So in the early 1900s, it made up 28% of all prescription medications. Eli Lilly, Park Davis, everybody knew cannabis was helpful. Problem is they didn't really know how it worked. So they would put it in all sorts of combinations. This was one night cough syrup. It's got cannabis, it's got morphine, it's got chloroform. Oh, and it's got some alcohol too, skillfully combined. So it worked, but nobody really knew why, right? So, and then we got to the dark ages, right? Into the big, deep into the Cheech and Chong era of stigma. So we lost that medical cannabis. Um, that came back in Canada, as I mentioned, in 2001, and we're starting to research it. It seems incredible where this research is going. It seems like, oh, this is the miracle cure. This is the next snake oil, right? But what they're doing is they're looking at where those receptors are for our own endocannabinoids. And if you know where those receptors are, then it would make sense that maybe you can use it for asthma. Maybe you can use it for osteoporosis, for diabetes, okay? Yeah, because these receptors are abundant. So it's helping our body. Now, of course, We've got lots of great first-line medications for a number of these conditions, but if people fail, you know, effectiveness, ineffectiveness, or intolerable side effects, maybe cannabis might be the answer. So this is the problem, and this is the problem that, that we face among our colleagues and health care professionals you hear all the time, the lack of clinical evidence of cannabis. Too many anecdotal stories, right? Your friend, they say, it works for me, but how does it work? We don't know, we don't, you know, it works on those receptors and what's the dose and how do we figure it out? Um, this is the biggest problem. In medicine, we like to have double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials. And we don't have a lot of that in cannabis. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of reasons why we don't. One is because it's been illegal for so long. Most of the studies that have been done on cannabis were looking at the harms of cannabis. There was big dollars put in the National Institute of Drug Abuse looking at the harms of cannabis for many, many years. So we've got lots of studies on that. And the good news is, well, it's not as bad as we thought. In fact, it's legal now. NIDA, the same organization, is now putting money into the research. Thank goodness they've tipped the scale and we're looking forward. But the best research is yet to come. And that's a really big problem for physicians and healthcare professionals to advise their patients without that lack of evidence. How do we know? Well. Again, as I mentioned, the good news is the, the, the evidence is increasing. This slide only goes to 2010, but from 2010 till now, the evidence is mounting huge. Some of the best evidence that we have, there's four conditions that, that are, have a, probably adequate enough uh, evidence based on what the National Academy of Science and Medicine says. Number one by far is pain. That's the one that's been studied the most with the, sort of the, the most abundant evidence. The other is spasticity in MS. Third is chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And recently, fourth, it looks like enough evidence 
for children with epilepsy, you know, tractable epilepsy, epilepsy Dravet syndrome, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, that's the four. Everything else is kind of less. We don't have the evidence. But we got so many people that says, it works for me. So what do we do? This is the dilemma, right? So in, in the, uh, the pain evidence, Mark Ware uh, out of McGill University has done some of the best uh, work with cannabis. And he looked specifically at pain. He looked at inhaled cannabis and found that it was you know, efficacious. Then he did a one-year study called the COMPASS study that looked at the efficacy but also the safety. And he double-blinded this, which was pretty interesting. That's hard to do with cannabis, but he was able to do it and found that you know, things that we worry about, impairment and cognition, tolerance, all of these things, didn't see it over a one-year. And again, I'm cautious because I'm talking about medical cannabis. When people are using recreational cannabis, they're using doses that are much, much greater than what we use in medical cannabis. That's another thing to keep in track of. The other thing too, in medical cannabis, a lot of the times, as I mentioned, we use more CBD than THC. What's interesting when you look at the data, the Canadian Pain Society embraced, um, yeah, the Canadian Pain Society embraced the data for pain. Because when I talk to physicians, they say, well, we should follow the guidelines. Like for asthma, for diabetes, you know, start with lifestyle modification, blah, 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 blah. Well, the Canadian Pain Society looked at the data, and in 2014, they came out with guidelines for chronic pain. And first-line therapy are things like Tylenol, anti-inflammatories, amitriptyline, right? Uh, gabapentin, Lyrica, you've heard these ones, right? That's first-line therapy. Second line, they put opiates. Now keep in mind, this is 2014, that's the last time that these guidelines were updated. If these guidelines were updated in 2019, I'm guessing opiates would not be number two for reasons I don't have to explain to you. Physicians and patients don't want opiates for a good reason. Um, when you look at the data as well, so what they did is they put in third line treatment, cannabinoids for the first time. So if you look and you say the Canadian Pain Society guidelines suggest that for chronic pain, treat with the first line, Opiates, debatable, but third-line cannabinoids, first time they ever listed them in their guidelines. And the reason they listed them is that they looked at the data and they said, there's something called NNT, or number needed to treat. It's a really interesting way to look at therapy. If, if every therapy worked, for instance, if I gave you this pill and it worked on everybody, it would have a number needed to treat, an NNT of one. It means that whatever, Eric, give this to everybody, it's always going to work. There's no such thing. There's no therapy that has an NNT of one. But a lower number is more effective, right? Well, cannabis comes in quite a bit higher. Again, don't use that word. Quite a bit um, uh, escalated on the list of effective uh, therapies versus the ones that were even first-line therapy. We use a lot of uh, gabapentin or neurontin for chronic pain, yet cannabinoids are more effective. Interesting. So that's pretty good evidence. And my colleagues and healthcare professionals say, oh, okay, let's follow the guidelines. Maybe cannabinoids would be good for pain. The interesting part as well is the number of people that are using cannabis, right? This only goes up to 2017, but there's about 165,000 people at 2017 that have been authorized. But what that means is they've gone to a physician, they've gone through the whole process, they've got the paperwork through federal regulations. There's 165,000 in 2017. Thanks to organizations like yourself, that number is now 330,000. It doubled in the last two years. That's within Canada. Now, that does not keep track of people that are just using it without seeing a doctor. And of course, as of October 16th, 17th, you can do that. Uh, you can get cannabis legally. And a lot, we know a lot of people are treating themselves, which is unfortunate because you'd like to have some guidance from physicians as to should you use CBD, what's the dosage, how do I administer it, should I use some THC, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the amount of people that have been authorized under the federal program has doubled in the last two years to 330,000, okay? The, it, have you all seen this form from your society? No? Well, this, was, uh, this is a second version, and it's how to authorize, you know, talk to your physician. It's about an eight-page glossy. You know, talk to your physician about the cannabinoid medicine and whether or not they suggest that you'd be a good candidate for it and how would you get authorized. And if your physician isn't comfortable with the process, maybe see another physician. So it was a real kind of push to patients to say, 
if again you have intolerable side effects or ineffectiveness, maybe see your doctor. The problem is we weren't prepared as physicians to see this document and a lot of physicians still don't have training in how to authorize for cannabis. The interesting part is there is no training for authorization for cannabis. You simply have to be an MD. Any doctor can authorize a patient for cannabis. In 2001, it was for very specific conditions. There were six conditions that you had to have. One of them was arthritis. Now, it's for any condition that a physician believes that cannabis would be an, uh, a, a suitable therapy for when you failed other treatments, okay? But this was a real big push from your own society. So what do people use cannabis for here in Canada? This was a survey that went out to some of those authorized legally through, um, through Health Canada. And it was a 2,000 patient survey and said, what do you use cannabis? Okay, you're authorized, what are you using it for? For medical purposes. Well, by far the top two were mental health and pain. That's what today's topic is about. So people are using it to treat their pain. Well, mental health is often related to chronic pain, as we heard, right? People that are in chronic pain often have anxiety, and they have insomnia, and they have depression. And the depression can be very, very severe. So people are using cannabis for these reasons. And if you look, if you ask those people, okay, that's your condition. You could only pick one condition, but what are your symptoms? Well, they could have many, many symptoms among their one condition. So if they were in chronic pain, or they had arthritis, quite often the symptoms were mental health symptoms. Again, anxiety, depression, insomnia, nausea, somnolence. So people were using cannabis for the same reasons that we're talking about today, okay? Let's talk about pain for a second, because again, it's very important that you understand how cannabis could work in pain to understand how it could work in mental health because of the association. Pain is literally a pain, okay? It's a pain on our body, it's a pain in our family, it's pain in our social units, it's a pain for employment, and it affects a lot of people as we've heard today. The problem is, as physicians, we don't get a lot of training in how to treat pain. And the other thing is, what do we use to treat pain right now? As I mentioned, the first-line therapies are not always successful or they're related to a lot of problems in, 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 in intolerability. We know Tylenol or acetaminophen is a big problem with uh, liver. And we know anti-inflammatories with the gut and the kidneys, um, uh, uh, you know, GI bleeds. The interesting part is cannabis, uh, and of course opiates we know, right, is, is the accidental opiate overdoses or the combination with sleeping pills. So what we have for current treatment for pain is, is not all that great. It's not as effective and it's also related to a lot of uh, comorbidities. What's interesting, of course, is cannabis is not related to one single direct cause of overdose, of a, of a death. And the reason there is goes back to where those receptors are and are not in the brain. Remember I said they're scattered all through the brain? But they're not in the brain stem. The receptors for cannabinoids are not in the area that runs our breathing and our heart rate. Those areas, though, are abundant in opiate receptors. So when you hear the fentanyl crisis, when you hear people overdose and die, it's because they stop breathing when those receptors are, are bombarded with opiates, okay? There are not cannabinoid receptors in the brainstem. We used to think that cannabis, you shouldn't use it with opiates because there's going to be a dangerous combination. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, we're seeing substitution and using it with opiates and getting people off of their opiates. So part of that 2,000 uh, person study, they said, okay, if you're using cannabis, are you using it instead of another thing, another medication, another therapy, or are you just adding it to the mix? Well, lo and behold, about 70% of people substitute cannabis for some other prescription medication that they were presently on. When I speak to insurance companies, they're like, oh, now we're interested. We don't want to just pay for another expensive medication to add to their pharma, you know, pharmacy list, but if they can reduce some of their other medications, maybe it's worthwhile. Well, the other thing that they found out of this study was people reduce their use of alcohol, uh, tobacco, and other illicit substances. And you know, I used to hear this a lot in my office. People would say, you know, Rob, I come home at the end of the day, and I find that the, you know, my life is different. I don't crack open a beer or two at the end of the day just to wind down to fall asleep. I never thought I had an alcohol problem before, but I just don't do that anymore. Now, the alcohol companies aren't too happy about this, but what's happening is people are generally happier. Their quality of life 
are better when they're using cannabis. They don't turn to the other, you know, things to make them feel good, such as nicotine uh, or illicit substances or alcohol. So that's very, very interesting. So then you say, okay, if you're dropping your prescription medications, which ones are you dropping? 35% was the, the number one uh, prescription medication people substitute for is opiates. Closely behind that are antidepressants, sleeping pills, other anti-inflammatories. So people are using cannabis for these instead. And you say to yourself, okay, well, if you're using it instead of opiates, are you just like one less dose a week? No, it's quite significant. 75% of people got rid of their opiates completely once they started building up the cannabis in their system. And about another 18, 20% of people reduced their dose by 75%. That's a lot to reduce your opiates. So, it, every individual's different. Every individual's different how long it takes to kick into your system. So what I generally do is I sell, say to people, okay, you're on your Tylenol-3, you're on your morphine, stay on it. I start adding the cannabis, until they find that they have control and sweet spot. A lot of times people use uh, long-acting medication, like your morphine cotton, MS cotton, and then they use breakthrough quick-acting morphine. And I'll say, if you're no longer having to reach for the breakthrough medication, we know we're getting there. Then we start slowly weaning. And again, we didn't know you could add the two together, but you can safely add the two together, cannabis with the opiate, once you've got control, then slowly bring people off the opiates. It's brilliant. Brilliant. So in the states where medical cannabis has been illegal, uh, starting with Colorado, they saw a correlation of accidental opiate overdose mortality dropped, about a 25% drop. What's interesting, it wasn't accidental. For every state that starts legalizing medical cannabis, there's an exact correlation. And states like Colorado, where it's been going for five or six years, their rate is now down 31%. So for every year medical cannabis is legalized, people are using less opiates. And you see it in Medicare, you see it in Veterans Affairs, people are using less sleeping pills, which are, uh, and also opiates, which is a dangerous combination. So we're seeing substitution, okay? This is a study that's just being published. Um, again, looking at how people are dropping their other medications. Uh, at the six month mark, we're seeing uh, uh, different opiates, we're seeing other anti-inflammatories, sleeping pills, antidepressants, but I just want to, it's just an amazing curve. And there's a concept here of what's called morphine equivalent. Every narcotic, they compare it to morphine, how strong or how weak compared to morphine. And they're seeing almost a 75% reduction in the morphine equivalent dosages um, in this study. This study, by the way, is not a survey. This study is done by physicians who are actually prescribing the medications to their patients. So they're able to monitor and they're seeing that the prescriptions are going down. So it's not self-reported that patients are saying, yeah, I'm not taking my narcotics. No, the physicians are actually tracking this. So that's, again, really remarkable. So when people take cannabis, how does it work for pain, right? Because we, we just thought, oh, they just get high. They, they don't know where they are. They just kind of dis, you know, dysregulate. We don't know what it is. Well, it wasn't until recently that they actually have kind of figured it out. There's two things that happen when people use cannabis for pain. One is their pain level actually goes down, great, but their quality, their type of perception of pain changes dramatically. And it makes sense to me now, because the other thing people would say to me is, Rob, my pain is still there, but it's different. And I kept saying, well, what do you mean? Explain it to me. And they go, well, I know it's there, but it's just not there. And I'm, going, I'm like, are you stoned? Like, what is it that you're, you're trying to describe to me? And finally, one lady said to me, Rob, it's like I left it in the next room, shut the door on it, and I walked away. I know it's still there, but I don't feel it directly in my bones. And that's when they did this study. It was a very small mouse study, which I laugh when I say that because all mice are small. But, but it, was a, it was a little mice, mouse study, and they, what they did is they took these mice and they rubbed capsaicin, which is red hot pepper, on the fur of these mice. Don't worry, it turns out to be a good story. Everybody feels bad. But they rubbed this on the mice, and the mice didn't like it, right? So they put them into a functional MRI machine, which lights up the parts of the brain that are reacting when they, don't, when they perceive pain in this area, the parts of the amygdala, the receptors, and all that. 
So then they took the mice out and then they got them to share, I don't know how they did it, like a joint or a little bong, a little mouse bong, I don't know what, it was a mini mouse bong, I don't know. But anyways, these mice got high or semi-high and, and then they rubbed the, the, the capsaicin on it and they zipped them in the machine again. And the parts of the brain changed. So the, how they perceived pain, those parts of the brain lit up under the functional MRI machine. And what's interesting is when you get referred to the pain clinic these days, they don't use a lot of pain pills anymore, right? They use a lot of injection therapy, but a lot of it is cognitive behavioral therapy, yoga, self, you know, reflection, uh, walking, exercise, eating kale, all these sorts of things that are supposed to be good for you, lights up that same part of the brain that these mice, when they were sharing the, so you don't have to eat kale anymore, just light up a little mouse doobie. Anyway, so that's how it works is in the brain. We can see that. So how, how does it work for mental health? You know, what's the evidence for mental health? Remember I said there was those conditions that we've got enough clinical evidence for? Problem is, all these people are using cannabis for mental health, right? We said like 40% of Canadians that are on authorization are using it for, you know, mental health symptoms. What's the evidence? We don't have a lot of evidence. I combed through looking at this, but this was kind of your brain on pot. Like it's got these receptors, but how does it exactly work? Well, they've done even studies that looked at upregulation of our receptors, our CB1 receptors, our cannabinoid receptors. So for instance, in arthritis, if you get inflammation in the cartilage, they've been able to look at the cartilage, and Dr. Spooner described this. It, they get actually increased cannabinoid receptors. So it's, they're like, help me out. I'm going to create more receptors. Please, I'm going to, my body, send me more cannabinoids. And let's reduce this inflammation and pain. They've been able to demonstrate that in arthritis. Well, lo and behold, in severe depression and in case of suicide, what they've done is they've done autopsies on the brains of suicide patients, and they have an increased regulation of their receptors as well. It's almost like they were a cry out for help saying, I need more cannabinoids. So they, there's a change in the brain in depression with this upregulation of receptors. But other than that, what's the evidence? Now, Dr. Zach Welsh, um, who's a clinical psychologist at UBC here, he's done the most extensive research into what is it in cannabis and mental health. Over a 50-year period, what he's found, there was only 31 studies done on cannabis very small studies, none of them randomized clinical trials. They were all simply surveys, about 24,000 patients over the last 50 years, saying, does it work for your de depression? Does it work for your anxiety? And they mimic what we've just seen in those other surveys. People say, yeah, it works for me, but there's no good randomized clinical trials. Same thing for sleep, but for anxiety, depression, what about for schizophrenia? What about for cognitive disorders, right? What we find is people that are abusing cannabis are at higher risk possibly for depression, possibly for anxiety if they're using THC, but when people are using it for medical purposes, treating themselves, it seems to be effective, but the evidence isn't there. This is something I stole completely from him this morning. I found this on his, uh, he gave a little webinar, and this hasn't been published yet. This is out of UBC in, in conjunction with the arthritis uh, center there. And it's looking specifically at arthritis patients. I think it's just over 250 patients. And what was different about these patients is they hadn't, some of them had not been using cannabis before. Different, of course, if they were in, they grew up in Salt Spring and their name is Parsley and Sisters Poppy Seed. They, I mean, they're basically inundated and it's a part of their mainstream. But for a lot of these people, they were, they were treatment naive on cannabis in the arthritis center there and, and treating them we're seeing this data coming out. And what's very, very interesting is exactly what I've been talking about, is the perception of pain changes, the reduction of pain, but the big circle there is a reduction of depression with cannabis. This is brand new information, not even published yet, but it's showing us probably the best study so far with arthritis and pain. So you ask the question, how much do you take? What's the dosage? What should, how do you administer it? This is a big stumbling block because not one dose fits everybody. Everybody says, you know, when I'm talking to my physicians, uh, colleagues, or pharmacists, they say, 
how many milligrams per kilogram, they, you know, that's how we do medicine in, for blood pressure or insulin and all that. You can't do that with cannabis. You literally have to find a dose that's appropriate for that individual because you can't tell how many receptors that they have. You literally start low and you go slow. The, the, uh, there's two major methods that we, we have authorized cannabis for, two major. One is inhalation, smoking it or vaporizing it. And you say to me, well, why would we even talk about that? Because in 2001, that was the only way Health Canada approved it, was dried bud to be sent out. That changed in 2016, now we have orals. People could make their own orals, but, but up until then, the only thing we had was inhalation. Well, inhalation is useful for a very small amount of people because it's a quick onset. When a person inhales through a vaporizer, it, you can get a, in, uh, a feedback on their pain within three to five minutes and last for about three hours, okay? So it's a very quick response. So if a person inhales, if they get a response, they stop. If they don't get a response after five minutes, they take another inhalation. That's how inhalation works. Oil is completely different. Oral oil takes about 60 to 90 minutes to kick into the body. It's not as high of a spike, again, and then, but it's longer lasting, about eight to 12 hours. So hour and a half onset, but long lasting, okay? Uh, vaporizers, I won't go over that. It's just simply heating the product up without burning it. We don't, we don't suggest smoking anything. There's been studies done on, on smoking cannabis and there is increased risk of phlegm and that. Not nasty stuff, but um, we don't wanna smoke anything. So vaporizers are better. Beware of the baked goods. I always have a conversation about the edibles. Everybody thinks they'll come into my office and say, Doc, I don't want to smoke anything. I just want a brownie. And I always tell them, you know, beware of the baked goods because we don't know what's in it half the time, right? Remember what I said about the 60 to 90 minute rule for kicking in. The problem is people start to munch on a brownie and they only wait half an hour. Tastes pretty good, so let's keep eating. And next thing you know, they're started to eat maybe three quarters of the pan. But when in, at 90 minutes when it kicks in, they get this large dose of cannabis, and if it has THC in it, they go on a trip. And it's not a trip that's really fun. They feel like they're gonna die, and then they get mad that they're not gonna die, okay? So they end up in emergency, and emergency just basically pats them on the head, sends them home. You don't do anything about it. You ride out the storm, but it could be a 10 hour storm. And then patients come back and they go, I'm allergic to marijuana. No, you took too much brownie. So the key is knowing what's in it and the dose. And you don't want to just dabble in baked goods. Okay. What's the best way to do it is an oil. An oil is a boring, straightforward way to use cannabis, but it's the most consistent response rate that you're going to get. An oil has an exact amount of how much THC and how much CBD per milliliter. It's mandated by Health Canada rules. They're manufactured by licensed producers, of which I mentioned one today, Canamed. And it, you order it and you can tell exactly the quantity or the, the consistency of the cannabinoids within it. So they'll have something called a one to 20. That's one part THC, 20 parts CBD per mil. Okay, 20 milligrams per mil, a 10-10, which is equal combination, or an 18-0, which is all THC. So you can, and there's a whole bunch of combinations. It's all compounding pharmacy. Again, you might want more of a CBD in the daytime and maybe a equal balance of THC and CBD at nighttime. And what's, what dose do you start with? The smallest amount, the syringe will come in. And you take that, maybe just start it at nighttime, and you, and you keep track of it for a week. So 0 0.1 milliliters for a week, and you say, that's nothing. Then you go to 0 0.2, and you keep going. If you're up to a full syringe and nothing's happening, then you want to change the balance of your oils, how much THC and CBD. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? Right? None of this, I'm going to take a gummy, I'm going to take a quarter of a cookie. have no idea what's in that. The other issue is dispensaries. Okay? So when people go to a storefront in Vancouver or Victoria, and you go to the bud tender. I heard, I, I heard this great, somebody called it an ombudsman. Ombudsman. I thought, geez. But they'll, they'll give you um, sort of an idea of what you should use. But they're usually whatever they have on their shelf. And we don't know what the content is. 
they are not regulated by Health Canada. So if you can walk into a store right now, unless it's a BC government store, which there's very few open right now, you're, you're literally, it's a Russian roulette. You don't know what's in it. And when I say to you, you should use CBD and use a little bit of THC, when you go to the dispensary, what they tell you is in it is not necessarily what's in it. We don't know where it's coming from, probably Bob's backyard, but it's, it's an illegal place. So right now, if you can walk in and see Bud, you're in the wrong place. Health Canada only allows the licensed producers to send it to your doorstep through an authorization from your physician. That's a huge, huge point to make. Most patients don't know that, and most physicians don't know that. Most people think you just get a little chit from your doctor and go to the store. It's very, very different, okay? What I'm talking about is literally an authorization through Health Canada to get a very specific oil that it has to be under certain growing conditions, no pesticides, and it's exactly what's in it like any medicine should be. So the process to get authorization for cannabis from a physician is you, you go to a physician who hopefully is comfortable with the process. They fill out a one-page form that has their name, their license number, your demographics, and there's two numbers on it. It's the amount of time that you authorize a patient for. It's anywhere from one day to 12 months. So you just, you know, you can pick 12 months. Okay, so it's authorized for 12 months. The other is grams per day usage. And that's a really confusing term because I just finished telling you, I have no idea what your dose is gonna be. What that usage is though, is a ceiling amount. In the old wild west of cannabis, you used to just give a person a medical card and then they would grow about 40 acres on an agricultural land reserve. And what would happen is they would say, well, I've got a card from my doctor. You can't do that anymore. If the doctor puts a number between one and five grams per day, there's actually a calculation of how much a person can buy at a time, grow at home, or possess within Canada. It's a, it's a lot smaller number than the olden days when people, you know, they'd open up the trunk, the RCMP would open up the trunk, and they go, we've got you, and he goes, no, I got a card. The, the RCMP can now look at the card and say, that doesn't equate, okay? So that's the only number, but it's not actually the amount that you're going to use. It's a maximum amount. So the question is, if your doctor's not comfortable with authorizing it, and there's a lot of doctors not comfortable, rightly so, because again, there's not a lot of education on this. If that doctor is comfortable referring to another doctor, then I think that's great because they're, again, there for the patient and they believe in their patient. I don't believe in what you just said is going to a private physician who charges to do that, these clinics. You don't have to do that. There are physicians that uh, under the medical plan that see patients on referral. I don't think it should be a business to have to pay larger, personally, to pay a larger sum of money to do something that's for medical purposes. So. Nabilone? Okay, so remember I said back in the, the, the different ones that work on the receptors, I said that there's our own body's cannabinoids, there's the plant cannabinoids, and then there's the synthetic cannabinoids, one called Nabilone or Sesamate. It's only THC. Now that you know about what the cannabinoids do, you don't necessarily want just only THC, right? You probably want more CBD. Unless you're nighttime, that might be a good thing to use for sleep and pain. But, but there's got no CBD in it. There is a uh, product, uh, I, I saw it on the slide there, it was in there, called Sativex. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, it's a synthesized product as well. It's a one-to-one -one THC to CBD ratio. It's out of GW Pharmaceuticals out of the UK. The MS Society of Canada has embraced saying that that's the best one to use because you can write a prescription for it. It's $28,000 a year. So unless insurance plan pays for it, which some insurance plans will, um, it's not practical. The plant, mother nature, it's a weed, it's cheap compared to $28,000, okay? So common adverse effects, these are all THC mediated, okay? 
So, you know, the, the somnolent, the, the disorientation, the red eyes, all that is THC, which is where we lead to the fact that it's relatively safe, at least. Um, if you compare it to other medications, I don't want to drive home the point too much, but it's a different phone number you call if you take too much cannabis, okay? It's no risk of overdose. But, I mean, again, I don't want to... I don't want to minimize, but the, the side effects are more nuisance things. It's, it's oh, I don't, I don't have a slide, but impairment is going to be the issue for recreational users, right? That's a whole other talk, is how do you, you know, discuss impairment, how do you, what is impairment, um, all the rest of it, anyways. So is, is cannabis addictive? Yeah, it can be. I mean, certainly you put it up against the other substances, it's less so. But you hear about something called cannabis use disorder or amotivational syndrome. Again, usually THC mediated. Again, usually high doses recreational users. But the number you see is 9%. This is the impairment. So I won't even talk about that if you want to have questions about it, but I know we're probably running out of time. There's a lot of things you can talk about cannabis. Um, I've talked about how you get cannabis which is funny in British Columbia, you can get it anywhere, but the only proper way is to get it through authorization of a physician. Oh, it looks like that's the end. So, <laughs> so that's good. Questions, yeah. My doctor's not, uh, is not comfortable when I ask him to take the powder. That's the commonest answer. And this, this, is a, this is the commonest question I get. I mean, most physicians, again, are not all that comfortable with it. And I get it. I totally get it. I do a lot of lectures to physicians, and they are so eager. They're taking notes like crazy. I, 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 I envision a day where it's going to be standard education for everybody, but the education that physicians are getting right now are the harms of cannabis. You will not get a talk like what I just mentioned about the reality, which then leaves people out in the cold because a number of people legally so, can go to the corner store and, and use it, but not have any direction from a physician. And that doesn't make sense. For one thing is the local budsman, um, they're not supposed to give you any advice if you're using it for medical purposes. It's the signs say that. You need a doctor. We are not allowed to talk to you about using this for sleep or arthritis or pain, or certainly for your kid's epilepsy. So where do you turn to, right? So fortunately, there are some clinics that are legitimate clinics and hopefully don't charge an arm and a leg and, and, and do it. But there's some there's physicians out there that, that are pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, and I'm happy to be one of them. But um, I think, again, if your physician believes in you and believes that it might work for you and you've exhausted every other possibility, then if you can come up with a name of one of those physicians, just ask your physician to... Uh, refer you. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't recommend that. I don't experiment with this with this medication or drug or whatever you call it. Um, in Vancouver. There is a clinic called MCRCI, I think it is. M yeah, if you could, f I'll get, maybe I can, but there's a, if there's a doctor, I mean, here's, Dr. McCallum, Dr. McCallum is excellent. There's also Dr. Carolyn McCallum. Yeah, there is a name here in Vancouver. The other is Dr. Uh, Shoichet, uh, S-H-O-I-C-H-E-T. They are in my circle of, that we, we run together in the same sandbox. Um, but there's, there's a group of us that share ideas and that. It's really fascinating for me because, um, again, we're on the cusp, I think, of learning, and, and I'm part of a physician sharing group, and so if we come up with an interesting topic that we just have never seen before, we'll throw out an email, and you would get emails from Yugoslavia, blah, blah, blah. It's fantastic to be a part of, um, because we're, we're learning with patients as well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I was just giving this mic. Um, I'm an old fart, and uh, I uh, recently had exactly the problem that this lady is expressing. Uh, I ended up 
with a referral from my family doctor, and uh, I took it to an outfit called the Greenleaf Medical Clinic in Langley. Okay. Now, you got to appreciate, I, this isn't a commercial break or anything, but um, I was very concerned because initially I was told, well, just go to the local pot store and see what they can do to help you. And I wasn't about to do that. So I went to this clinic, and they have a staff of doctors, and uh, it's all oil that I'm dealing with. And they were extremely helpful. There They're you all, go. They are online. Okay. They track you. They monitor you. They follow up with you. And uh, it was extremely helpful for so, a person who was a neophyte. So they this. take referrals from the doctor? They take it. You can do it two ways. They took a referral from my doctor because that's the way I elected to go into their system. But if you don't have a doctor, they have doctors on staff they would prefer you get the referral, but if you don't have anyone who can refer, you can go to them and they will put you through a process and assign you to a doctor. Is, is there a cost with that? Yes, there is. I think it's about $100 for the year. And Reasonable then. And yeah. They, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they use that. They do the paperwork. They, they do the diagnosis. They do the per prescribing. And then, as you explained, uh, they do the dosing. Yeah. And you stay in touch with them at any time. You can phone them, uh, and they will meet with you, talk to you. You can do it online. It's it's really a wonderful service That's great. for somebody who is the, concerned about, if you will, the the shadier part of yeah. the business. I think that's great because you need this sort of the specialized advice. Um, and there is no specialty. Like I say, you can't get training in this. So, you, so I've learned it by the seat of my pants for 18 years now. But... Um, the other thing I always say to patients, I'll get the, you know, people contact me and say, my doctor doesn't believe in it, but will you see me? And I go, no, I won't. I don't want to do anything behind the back of your own physician. That's not good medicine. They need to be, in, you know, and I'll just say, go back to your physician and say, I'm willing to see you. And it, most often physicians will go, oh, okay, okay. As long as you'll see him and you'll take responsibility, you know, you know, I don't have to work with a college. I don't, you know, I'm worried about malpractice. If I'll take that responsibility on, most physicians will hand off the torch. Very few will just draw a line in the sand and say, no way. More and more. It's interesting. Five years ago, um, I was almost run out of Victoria by some of my colleagues thinking I was just, you know, do, pushing the envelope too much. And especially a couple of uh, neurologists. But anyways, they now refer me patients. They call me up and say, Rob, I've got another one. What do you, can you do? Blah, blah, blah. The tide has really changed, okay? So I, I don't think you have to be as wary of your own physician. You should never be. You've got to have a good rapport with your physician. Be honest and say, this is what I want to do. Here's the avenue. But I think if you give them that information that there's a place like this clinic I'd like to go to, can you please support me? My gosh. I mean, I, I would think, unless that physician has a very good reason to say to you, no, you're on uh, this medication or uh, you haven't tried this or the evidence... Uh, you know, give, give a reason, but just to say, no, I, I think we've gone beyond that. We should be. Okay. But I don't recollect in the couple of days that I tried it, having that. So the question is, just for the webinar people, you know, not getting the side effect of the THC high? I guess it would depend on the dose, right? And also, if you're, are you from Salt Spring? Okay. Uh, okay, poppy seed. Uh, no. Um, most people, the tolerability is because it's just THC on its own. So if you keep taking enough of it, I mean, you might be lucky and you might be a really good responder at a low dose and not have that impairment, then great. Then that would be the way to go. Uh, it's prescription standardized, it's been around a long time. So yeah, that would be good. You're, you might be, that might be perfect for you. Well, he was reluctant to give it to me, but I requested him about the cannabinoids, and this was what he suggested. Yeah, and, and I think probably more physicians are comfortable with uh, sesamate or nabilone, because again, it's been around for 20 some odd years, and it, it's so easy, you just write a prescription, a lot, of the, a lot of the insurance companies will pay for it. So we're still used to writing 
those kind of prescriptions rather than going through this paperwork and sending to Health, Health Canada to be involved and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. That process has been around for a while. So I think a lot of physicians are more comfortable with that, yeah. Can I bring up Dr. LePage and Dr. Chin too uh, to see if there's any other questions for them? I actually had two questions that I thought might be interesting that I thought potentially you guys could address as well. So the medical cannabis brochure that was posted online, that's available on our website um, at arthritis.ca. We also have a number, if you go to our website and search medical cannabis or mental health or uh, diet, there was a question about diet, any of those things are available on our website. This presentation and the other presentation that uh, Dr. Sleely referred to, Dr. Spooner's presentation, they're also posted on our YouTube channel, so you can re-watch them as well and we can email you out the resources too. So I, the two questions I had were the one, one more specific, I think, to Dr. Chin was about inflammatory arthritis specifically and medications that you're being used to treat medical um, inflammatory arthritis and how they may potentially interact with medical cannabis if people are trying it and um, what you should do, how would you manage that and if you should use both. So uh, I've been to a couple of talks now about medical cannabis, and I, I'm actually a believer, and I actually support my patients to use medical cannabis. I just don't know how to do it, though. So when they do ask me, I personally have not prescribed, but I need to talk to Rob and figure out when he's doing his next uh, physician education event so that I can learn more about it so that I can actually fill out the paperwork. So I've deferred a bit. You know, I say, well, you can talk to your family doctor. You can look online. I've mentioned Caroline McCallum to some of my patients as well. So I know it is accessible, so I'm a supporter of patients using it. My caveat was this with inflammatory arthritis. So you know, inflammatory arthritis, I showed you some photos of those diseases with those hands being all destroyed, the spine being stuck. So medical cannabis does not replace those types of drugs. So some of the stronger biologic medications, the DMARs, the methotrexate, the Humeras, the Intanercepts, those types of medications, because those prevent the disease getting worse. So you still need to be on those medicines to prevent the damage that you saw that I showed you in those photos. But in combination, using uh, cannabis for pain control, I think I would support that. You know, oftentimes patients still have pain despite controlling the inflammation. So I try Tylenol, I try anti-inflammatories, but I agree they have a lot of those have a lot of side effects. So I'm I'm definitely supportive of patients using cannabis, particularly for opioids. So I don't prescribe opioids. I tell the patients like I don't bring my triplicate pad to my office. I just will not prescribe it for you. But I understand some patients when they're in so much pain, they need something to control their pain. And I think uh, cannabis and CBD in particular would be a, a great option for these patients. So I need to learn more. And then my second question was more of Dr. LePage focused. I see a lot of people in the crowd today who lean in pair. So what advice would you give to a loved one of somebody who is dealing with chronic pain? In, in term, from a mental health perspective. Yeah. From a, like, how would you? somebody who's the partner of somebody dealing with uh, arthritis and mental health issues. Right. How would you? So uh, I'll just take one step back. So I, I've uh, heard from the docs that often will say, you know, I've got a patient that comes in and they're crying in my office. And that's when I usually get the referral. Um, so at that point, probably you, you have seen them at home um, crying or uh, not being themselves, not themselves. And I mean, obviously they are still adjusting to their diagnosis and or their chronic pain and symptoms. Uh, so I think it's just, you know, uh, looking out for the signs. Uh, when somebody is not themselves in a sort of a negative way, obviously, in terms of uh, their mood is low, uh, they don't seem to want to be doing the things that they used to do, they're not getting pleasure out of them if they are actually getting out of the house. A lot of uh, my patients will isolate themselves and they don't want to talk to, their, uh, to the people that they used to talk to. Um, about sort of personal um, things. And so those are the sorts of things I think you'd be looking at. <clears throat> also just sort of the, the general symptoms, other symptoms of depression would be if their appetite has changed, if their fatigue level has changed. 
um, uh, if their sleep is disrupted. Now, a lot of these things also overlap with chronic pain, um, but if you have a sort of a, a cluster of these things that are continuing to happen and you see them struggling um, or not seeming to want to communicate with you, but you are, they're clearly struggling, then that might be the time to at least, uh, you know, uh, either go with them or suggest that they actually go on their own for or at least one or two sessions sort of thing. I am the, uh, the partner of someone who has rheumatoid arthritis and has had it for many years. And uh, you ask, you know, what, what can you do as a partner to help? Well, I, if you can't tell already, if you're listening at home, I'm a guy. And our favorite thing to do to try and help is to fix things. And when you're facing a chronic disease like this, as this is speaking as a partner, what's really, really terrible is to feel helpless because it's, it becomes obvious that you, as in I, I could not fix this for my wife. And the best thing that I can do is to listen, to be supportive. And it's only supportive if she feels I'm doing what is supporting her. And as soon as I move into fixing mode, it stops being supportive in most cases. When she wants my help, when she wants me to, to do something, to correct it, to fix something, she can tell me, but listening. Are there any questions online? No questions online. All right. Well, thank you all very, very much for coming today. Um, I also want to thank our uh, speakers today, Dr. Chin, Dr. LePage, and Dr. Seeley. Thank you again to our sponsors and supporters who made today, today's event possible. We would really appreciate it if you guys could fill out the evaluation forms that are on your chairs. We do have extra pens somewhere if anybody needs a pen. Uh, we use those evaluation forms to ensure that the content that we have for these sorts of events is relevant and meaningful. So we would certainly appreciate that feedback. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you at our Walk for Arthritis on Saturday, June 1st. Thank you. <laughs>